I'm going to be talking today about a couple different projects I did back in 2011. I know 2011 uh, seems like a, a, a long time ago now, um, but it was my heyday uh, doing archaeology in in New Mexico, in the American Southwest. Um, this was about a year before I took the position as manager at uh, Haymas Historic Site. And, went, and at the time I was working for the Office of Archaeological Studies. So up until this point, we've kind of talked in broad strokes. Last time we talked about broad strokes of hunting in New Mexico. Now we're gonna look at some case studies uh, using archeology span to kind of uh, projects, cultural resource management projects and how they relate, how they, how they talk about the archaeological records, what archaeologists really do, as opposed to a college-based lecture. We're going to be looking at more academic research done in the cultural resource management field. Um, and the first talk I'm going to, to give today is uh, corn and cotton, and I expect this talk to last about approximately 20 minutes. Archaic life along the Mimbris River. Um, in 2011, the Office of Archaeological Studies was contracted uh, by the Department of Transportation um, in regards to the widening of a road, um, uh, specifically uh, changes to an intersection between New Mexico 26 and US 180. If you don't know what roads those are, they're just north of, of Deming, New Mexico. That intersection is just north of Deming, New Mexico. It's the place where if you take the bypass route from um, uh, Hatch and you go over towards Deming, instead of going all the way down to I-10, uh, that road where it cuts into the road that goes off to Silver City. Uh, Robert De La Russo served as the principal investigator of the, uh, the project, but uh, the field work was really done by myself and an archaeologist by the name of Stephen Lenz, with the support of a uh, uh, field crew, which included Richard Montoya, Isaac Cohen, Donald Tatum, Mary Wiaki, Gavin Bird, and Vernon Foster. After doing the project, uh, a final report was issued in 2015, um, and you can actually download it online. So if you're, you're really interested in this project, you can actually read about it. It's, I think, about a 500-page document on the work. But uh, specifically, um, we're going to look at what some of the findings are. So you don't have to read a 500-page a technical document to find out what this project was all about. Uh, the archaeological site along that section of the road was designated LA159879. If you're wondering how it got that number, all that really means is Laboratory of Anthropology and a designation after it, it has to do with whatever number was, was next in the database uh, when the site got added to it. Uh, it's a large site, about 320 meters north-south uh, by about 80 meters east-west. And if you'll notice, it's, it's uh, right along US 180. Um, on the way up towards Silver City. Uh, the, the project area itself is located in the Mimbris River floodplain. Um, it is about half a mile north of the river's current course. We don't know if that was the course of the Mimbris River uh, at the time people were living on the site, but it's probably pretty close. Um, and as you can see from this map, all these, this, these dots, which don't amount to much of anything, um, you can kind of see, uh, you know, the, the, the red e uh, represents flaked stone, uh, whereas blue is fire cracked rock, uh, black is ground stone, and, and there's also some features on there as well. You can see kind of a distribution of, of material culture in that general area. There were, it, when we documented, there was about 25 features and about 2,000 artifacts recovered from the project uh, associated with the road widening. Uh, what did those features look like? Well, of the 25 features, 21 were determined to be cultural. Uh, that means we, we, we assigned 25 features. Four of them ended up being uh, natural phenomenon. That could be anything from, from uh, a prehistoric rodent nest uh, to uh, any, any sort of natural, non-man-made uh, uh, feature. Uh, the rest were uh, thermal features and architectural features. Um, and on the left, you can actually see what one of those thermal features looks like. It's a cluster of fire cracked rock. That actually represents a hearth that was probably on top of a, a coppice dune, which uh, later deflated. So you don't have the hearth. Everything's blown away, but you just have the rock associated with it. And the one on the right is a, uh, there is a hearth in the foreground, but then behind that, you can see a, a shallow pit. Um, associated with um, uh, possibly a wikia, a small archaic structure. It's, it's only about a meter and a half to two meters in diameter. It's not very, very big. I think that one's about a meter and a half. 
Um, but these are the kinds of features that were found at the project. Um, we, we, we were able to get uh, radiocarbon samples uh, from some of the features, and you can see the distribution right there, based upon the, the chronometric dates that we're able to get from the, the, the features and cultural context, you really have two periods of occupation, which you can kind of see here. You can see a cluster on the left, uh, which is associated with the late archaic or early agricultural period in the, in the, um, in the southwest part of the state. And then in the right, you, at the bottom, you kind of see another cluster show up that represents your proto or early historic period. Um, the bulk of the habitation is associated with that late archaic. And if you really do some statistical analysis on all those little curves you see, really what we're looking at is most of the occupation was between about 864 and 788 BC. Um, however, two of the hearths uh, in the, the bottom right corner represent occupation in the 16th or 17th century. Flake stone is another way that you can, you can you can look um, at occupation. Um, here we had over 1,400 pieces of flaked stone. Um, most of it was unidentified chert, which is a catch-all for all sorts of things. There wasn't a lot of obsidian or, or, or nice, um, nice flake stone material, such as alabates or chuska or anything like that. It was mostly just undifferentiated chert. You can see it's, it's pretty unspectacular necessary to look at, look at, but there was a broad array of tools um, it, with, within the assemblage suggesting they were doing things, they, all sorts of different things were happening in site, core reduction, biface reduction, hunting, uh, shaft refurbishing, leatherworking, woodworking, chopping, and pounding based upon uh, the materials we had, and most of the projectile points, uh, all of which I think are featured here. Uh, the most common type projectile point was San Pedro, we had about five of those. We had some Polona points, Waco points, and one um, Bahad or J point. Um, the J point is likely a curio. That comes from the early archaic. Um, it, it may have been something somebody walked onto the site later on, not something somebody made at the site. Um, you know, they may have picked it up and reused it for something. There's no evidence that uh, we have an early archaic occupation at the site. Uh, groundstone was the second most common artifact type, and you can you can um, see the most interesting groundstone artifact in the photo above. Uh, most of it was monos and matates. Uh, there were some abraders, pestles, and mortars. Um, most of these things were relatively small and potentially portable, and, and, and not to mention monos and matates, they're usually associated with processing plant uh, materials. Uh, but the most unusual was this, this little uh, kind of round object with a, with a hole in the middle of it. If, if it's about three centimeters in diameter and you've got a good, pretty good scale there on the photo, um, but it has deeply etched striations all over it. So you can see scratches all over its surface. So it was polished and then somebody scratched, um, scratched it for unknown reasons that we can't possibly go. Um, it, it, and likely because it has that drilled hole that you can see at its base, it was probably attached to a staff or a club. You know, the, the funny thing is, I mean, I'm not saying that they had wizards, obviously they didn't have wizards, but that probably, they, you know, if I, I use my imagination, that looks like the top of a wizard staff. It's not, but an interesting object nonetheless. Um, uh, we also did a lot of work um, on botanical studies. Uh, these included macrobotanical flotation, pollen, phytolith analyses. Um, uh, the only domesticated plant species found in the assemblage were corn and cotton, both of which dated to the late archaic period. Um, however, there was a wide array of edible plant species, including amaranth, saltbush, goosefoot, walnut, uh, rice grass, drop seed grass, purslane, and mesquite. Uh, most of these were, were definitely used during the archaic period uh, for food uh, and other uses. Um, Fauna was incredibly limited, but it, it, it consisted almost exclusively of lagomorphs, or um, as we talked about last time, the, the cottontail and, and jackrabbit. Uh, most likely the desert cottontail, though you can't tell that in the bones, and the black-tailed jackrabbit, which are, 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 are common in that area. In fact, uh, that is the area when you see those pictures of me hunting black-tailed jackrabbits, that's where I hunt them. Uh, they're very, very common in that area. The other one is, of course, turtle, ornate box turtle, we believe. Um, and all three can be acquired in the immediate vicinity of the city. Um, 
based upon these materials, we, we, we felt very good that we could track down not only subsistence activities, but seasonality. Um, the absence of storage features in the array of artifacts is just that it likely served as a seasonal camp. It wasn't some sort of base camp that was used long term. It was focused on the exploitation of wild plant resources growing in and around the Mimbris River. Uh, fauna presumably represents species that were encountered, not targeted. So things that while you're, you're um, these are all animals that you would see if you were walking around gathering the, the, the wild grasses, these are animals we would likely encounter uh, during those activities. These are not things that you went out to hunt specifically, but rather things you came upon. And, and based upon the presence of fox turtle, um, along with the range of plant resources exploited, we're pretty confident that occupation of the site was during the months between, during the time of the monsoon season between about June 15th and September 30th. Both corn and cotton, have been found in late archaic contexts before. That's not very unusual. Um, it, and corn has actually been dated earlier elsewhere. Um, however, the, the presence of cotton pollen under uh, one of the patates is um, the earliest uh, pollen, cotton pollen we have in New Mexico. Um, we suspected uh, pollen doesn't usually preserve very well, neither the, the in, in it rarely, it, it probably existed in the American Southwest for longer than we think it did, but, but evidence for it has been extraordinarily li limited. And here we found some really good evidence of cotton in the region. Um, these, dom these domesticated plants um, were probably intentionally planted in the area, but perhaps not cared for year round. There's no evidence that these people lived at the site for any length of time. Instead, they were probably planted and every year when they would come back to this region as part of the monsoons, these, um, these domesticated plants could be used as a buffering, um, a, a, a rely, could be reliably gathered in the area. So you throw down a couple corn kernels, you come back to in some cotton, you come back, you know, next summer, you know you're gonna come back to this area. If it's grown, that's great, and you exploit it. If it doesn't grow, you still work on the wild resources, or maybe it's a really dry year and nothing grew in the area and you don't spend any time in the area. But it, it's, it's, it's a risk management strategy plant these items. So these are not people that are focused on agriculture. These are people, these are hunters and gatherers that do some limited form of agriculture. Uh, moreover, the site was a, um, it, it, this kind of goes into what I was just saying. The site is not a single instance in time. So it's very easy to see these 25 features and think, oh God, there must have been a sizable population there. There were, you know, there were people, there were multiple hearths and things of that nature. The site's a palimpsest, which means that even though you can't see it from the surface, all of these hearths and all of these habitation, these little wiki up structures, uh, very few of them were likely contemporaneous. Rather, they represent people coming back to the same place at the same time of year for many years over and over and over again. And most of these features probably didn't preserve at all. In, in fact, the only few where we, we have good preservation is where they actually dug down into the cliche. So there are probably hundreds, if not thousands of more features in this area that just do not survive in the archeological record and human activities. Um, and, and, and if we look at the broader scope of things, we're looking at probably a site that was active from about 1000 uh, to, uh, or 1050 to 429 BC. So a long period of time which people were coming back to the same area just north of Deming to gather uh, wild plant resources. Um, but they're not the only people there. And in fact, this palimpsest is made more problematic because when you look at it across the entire array of, of what you're looking at, you go all these features, and you look at your projectile points, you go, this is, this is an archaic period um, habitation that they're doing these things during the archaic period. And yeah, that's what it looks like, except for the fact that when you do some of these chronometric traits, they come back with very, very different date ranges. Uh, later proto-historic hunter and gather peoples also occupied the site. However, their activities are, are pretty much identical to the earlier archaic people and are impossible to distinguish except for the radiocarbon date. We would never know that these proto-historic, possibly patchy, uh, patchy or, um, or other mobile hunter and gather groups were even in the area if it wasn't for this chronometric uh, data. And a lot of these sites down here in the, the, the southwestern New Mexico, they only run one or two dates. And if, you, if we had only run one or two dates, we would have assumed this whole thing was associated with the late archaic. 
Uh, so conclusions, um, the, the site falls within the expected norms of archeological sites, uh, typically associated with the late archaic period. Um, they returned to the site um, year, you know, repeatedly, and they focused on processing wild plants along the Mimbris River during monsoon season. The presence of early cotton was unique, but agriculture was certainly well established by this time. And in many locations, it was more developed. Um, this is a mortar pounding stone uh, for grinding plant resources. Um, and certainly later proto-historic peoples occupied the site. However, the presence would have gone unrecognized as not for radiocarbon date. That is a brief overview of that project. Before I get into the next, pro well, I'm actually do both projects because I think we have time. I'm gonna move off to the next slide. You can read about it in a late archaic, early agricultural period pit site, uh, period site in the Mimbers Bolson near De Deming, uh, Luna County, New Mexico uh, by Aikens, Barber, Del Russo, and Lentz. Uh, you can read that, it's, it's good bedtime reading because sure, I'm sure it'll put you to sleep. If it doesn't put you to sleep, ask for your money back. Um, the next one I want to talk about, since I still have time, I'm not going to go into questions right now because I, I want to try to get through both of these. Um, so the same month I finished um, that archaic site uh, down on the flats, um, uh, minerals, uh, the minerals department, environment, uh, the abandoned mine bureau actually, um, brought up that they wanted us to do a survey of Cook's Peak. Cook's Peak is the mountain overlooking this um, the Mimbris Basin down by Deming. And I was asked to go take a look at the mining camps. So I ended up spending the whole year out in Deming, uh, but most of my time was actually spent documenting um, uh, later Apache sites in, in mining camps in the Cook's Range. Uh, here's the Cook's Range if you don't know what it looks like nowadays. So if you're looking at this photo right here, you'll see off to the right, there's like a grassland or desert land down below in the valley. So that's where that archaic site was, it's down in that valley there. That's where um, Deming is today. You're standing at the north end of, of Cook's Range, also known as Standing Mountain amongst the Apache peoples. Well, I'm not gonna talk about Apache sites in the area today. Um, there's a large number of them in the area. There's also uh, several um, classic member of sites in this area, uh, one of which is on pri uh, private land. And I had the opportunity to visit it with the rancher who owns the land. Um, it had been uh, like most member sites, it had been devastated by pot hunting, um, but really impressive to look at. Uh, so Cook's Range, located in Luda County, New Mexico, northeast of Deming. It's dominated by a single large peak known as Cook's Peak, about 8,408 feet in height. Uh, and it's a ge geologic mix of igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks. Um, you're definitely in the, as you look here at the, um, the vegetation, you're definitely in the Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, in these upland areas, you can get some trees, um, not a lot of trees and not big trees, but you get some trees. Um, uh, minerals in the Cook's Range. Well, um, tectonic activity and erosion have resulted in an ore body at Cook's Range that is near the present day ground surface, which is a nice way of saying you can walk up on valuable minerals in the Cook's Range. Uh, they're, de they're easily detectable and exploitable. You don't have to use some impressive machinery it doesn't require a lot of geologic knowledge. You just go, ah, I think that looks like silver. Indeed, it is silver, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and, my, and mining focused on lead, zinc, and silver in the area, all of which are a gray mineral. Um, however, there was some gold, copper, and fluoride extracted. Um, the mining district uh, was the most productive in Luna County with over 4 million in lead, zinc, and copper. Copper, silver, and gold produced between about 1876 and 1965. Um, it was discovered uh, by a rancher and prospector by the name of Edward Orr. And um, the, the, uh, the area has been collectively known as the Cook's Peak Mining District by about 1890. Um, however, calling it a mining district is, eh, um, it's not very formal by mining district standards. And, and really, um, to look at the district, you, you kind of have to go by the three large mining camps which were established in the area of Cookstown. Havley Town and Jose Town. You can see the abandoned added here. So you can see the front of the mine is actually collapsed in. So there's the, the doorway that used to let you in the mine, but obviously uh, the, the entryway of the mine's all collapsed in and now you can just walk past the, um, and filled in, you can walk past the doorway, which is part of the problem. A lot of these uh, mines that are being closed by the Abandoned Mine Bureau 
are, are unsafe for, for visitors. People go in there thinking they're going to find gold, Spanish silver or gold or whatever, and they get hurt in there. Um, so we close the, the whole project was associated with documenting these mines so they could be closed up. Uh, here's a historic photo of Cookstown. Cookstown uh, went from about 1882 to 1927. So the last person left it in 1953, so you could say it lasted till 1953, but it wasn't much of a town after 1927. Uh, it's located in the northeast corner of the range, and it's the largest of three camps. It had as many as 30 permanent structures, which by terms of a mining camp is large. In fact, if you look at the image I'm showing you, all those white structures you see on the hillside um, that kind of dot further up, there's a lot more of them than that, are actually tents. Um, the, the, the permanent structures are actually um, the, the, the ones you see more in the foreground. Um, there was numerous commercial businesses, including a reported 16 saloons. Uh, there was no church house, but a schoolhouse was built in the town. And we're just going to go through some pictures. This is what Cookstown looks like today. Um, you can still see the footings of some of those structures, the, the lower at levels of those structures. So if you're looking on the left, you're looking at an overview of a lot of the town. And then on the right, you're looking at, I think, what was part of the general store there. Um, you can see some of the mines, uh, with the cribbing of some of the mines, and some of the abandoned um, cars that have just been left out there, um, kind of in the, the way. The, the, the second largest town was Hadley Town. It went from about 1880 to 1929. Once again, if you count it to the last person that lived there, you go to 1943. It was named after Walter Hadley, a miner and prospector, which helped found the nearby Lake Valley. It's located on the east of the range, uh, south of Cookstown. Uh, and the community surrounded the mine that you see in this picture. The mine you see up close here is Graphic Mine. It was the largest mine in Hadley Town, um, which had uh, five saloons and two female places, as well as a general store. Uh, female places are, um, yeah, you can probably figure it out. Um, if you can't, you can ask me that question after we're done talking. Um, here's a picture of uh, Hadley Town today. If you'll notice, uh, if you look at that picture in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see some um, kind of yellowish dirt, mounds of dirt. Uh, those represent the waste piles of um, graphic mine that you see there, as well as some structures kind of in the, the, the near facility, the near in the image, which represents the actual structures of the town. Uh, looking to the right and getting closer, you know, I said most of the structures in these towns were, were tents, and you can see right here a retaining wall associated with the tent pad. So this retaining wall is built to, to flatten out a space that you put the tent on the, on the top of it. There's also a nice uh, abandoned car there. Lots of abandoned tent cars in, in, in uh, the Cook's Range. Uh, you can see some of the structures here. Here's a stone structure, uh, a later one uh, that was built as well as it looks like I took that picture on September 29th, 2011. Um, so years ago now, um, as well as a shaft going into one of the mines here, one of the more impressive shafts. Um, if that ladder doesn't look fit for human beings, it, I, I agree with you. Uh, however, that's the ladder that they had. And that shaft extends down, I think, 100 or so feet into the rock. Um, Jose Town, we don't really have any good pictures of, uh, historic pictures, but it also went from about 1880 to 1937. Uh, it actually had a lot of different names, which might be the reason why we aren't able to find many pictures of it. It went by Raphael. Um, and then they wanted to call it Alma, but they chose Jose because they found out the name Alma was already taken. Um, it's located in the northwest corner of the range, so uh, kind of on the opposite side of the mountain from uh, Cookstown. And according to historical documents, consisted of only a few, sh a few old shacks, uh, one of which served as a post office for about three years, from 1902 to 1905. Um, it contained a very important mine though. And you can see that plat for that mine here. This is the Gladys Lode and the Gladys Mine. Um, this is what Cooks, uh, Jose Town looks like nowadays. It's, it's, it's pretty ephemeral looking. Um, it's, it's literally a field of Ocotillo for the most part, uh, interspersed with, with desert grasses. And you can see on the right-hand side, that's one of the major shafts that goes into Gladys um, on the right-hand side. Uh, to the left, we can see one of those old shacks that's fallen over. And then on the right, what, what is really some impressive um, 
for, for, Cook's, for Cook's Peak Mining District, uh, use of ore carts uh, on the right-hand side, and that leads into a shaft, which I've got a picture of that. Uh, actually, that would be an adit because it goes into the mountain um, horizontally, not vertically. Um, but it's, uh, you can see it just drops right off the side of the mountain uh, below there. Uh, so what did we get from all these things? I, I kind of showed you a couple pictures of what we documented and what we found there. I spent months out there. So what did we find? Uh, well, first of all, characterization of mining. Uh, mining was widespread. There was about 20 tons of ore removed from the Cook's Range between only 1904 and 1943, which was well past the heyday. Uh, but it was all small scale. There was limited use of rail systems and cribbing, and most of it was speculative. Uh, we had thousands of mines, which were less than 12 feet deep. Um, these, you know, these classified as mines per se, but they were really nothing more than prospect pits. In fact, in many locations, it looks like some guy just brought a whole bunch of dynamite out there and blasted every few feet and then dug it out and then blasted more into it, blasted more into it. And then when he got bored of that one, he went on to another one. Um, it's possible they were retrieving minerals from these small uh, mines, uh, but we, it, we don't know how profitable it was for a lot of these small scale speculative endeavors. Uh, they certainly weren't producing enough um, silver out of these uh, 12 foot deep holes uh, to um, to uh, make it some sort of actual business per se. It may have been one or two miners, not a, a huge enterprise. And it's obvious that these people doing this work um, had no limited knowledge of mining. There's no formal planning of the mines or the towns, and there's only a handful of claims that are patented. Now I know probably from your perspective, what represents, you know, you watch those old Western movies, you go, well, all the mining camps were really speculative and a haphazard and stuff like that. No, they're really not. In fact, another area I worked in, um, in Northeast New Mexico, the coal mining camps in the Northeastern part of the state, those are completely company run towns and they look amazing everything's laid out on grid everything's done with attention and planning uh, that's not what this is um, in fact we found an article from one of the people who lived out at, at cook's peak about earlier times murdy mcdaniel moore um, she was the daughter of one of the um, most famous mine owners and she recorded uh, there were as many as a thousand men working in the mines at one time most of the workers before the turn of the century were from a tribe of Indians in Mexico. These Indians were employed mostly as ore carriers. A bag with a 50 pound capacity was held on their backs by a strap across their forehead. Carrying this load in such an awkward way, the men would walk through the tunnels and up the primitive ladders at the mine entrance, deposit their burden and go back down for another load. A few years later, tracks were laid through the mine and one man could push a cart, cart a car containing 200 pounds of ore. This is a summit mine, which is one of the ones her family owned in the Cook's Range earlier on. And you could see that, that ore cart that was added to the mine. Um, the mine owners of Cook's Peak. Um, so we did a lot of investigation on who owned the mines. Um, certainly that gives you an idea. Um, and, and this was primarily done through mining claims and homestead patents. So we looked at who was claiming or staking out uh, areas and, and, and whose name was it in. Uh, uh, the names included Elias and Orr, Upton McDaniel, which is a father or grandfather of Murdy, um, Riley George, Charles Poe, Edwin Hyatt, and A.P. Taylor. Most of these people had no background in mining. So just like we thought with the archeological record, we looked into these guys' past, they really had no skill at mining whatsoever. Um, uh, McDaniel um, was initially the postmaster at nearby Forts Cummings, so he was a, a postal clerk. Uh, George uh, controlled the only drinkable spring in the area, so he supplied water to all the miners. Poe owned the general store, and Hyatt was a rancher. So these are people that just ended up um, going into it. If that looks like a, a lovely family, uh, know that the young boy that you see in the far right-hand side is actually Riley George. Um, and he's going to kill his father at um, some point. Uh, he shot his uh, father-in-law. So uh, happy family photo until he shot him in the face. Uh, population at Cook's Peak. By all accounts, it fluctuated from hundreds to thousands. It was seasonal and dependent upon the price of silver, like all mining camps. 
Unfortunately, even though it was going strong by 1880, nobody from the US Census went up there. So we have no information whatsoever. Um, to make things worse, the 1890 census, which would have, would have uh, documented the, the towns at their heyday, um, no longer exists. It was actually burned in a fire. They don't have the 1890 census. So we're only left with the 1900 census, which records 343 people living at Cookstown. Uh, interestingly enough, as much is made about the history of Lake Valley and how big it was, uh, in the 1900 census, there were more people living at Cookstown than at Lake Valley. So even while those numbers seem small, they were still larger than most other mining camps in the region. Uh, and interestingly enough, if we put all those names into a blender or into a, a, a pro, an Excel spreadsheet, when we put them all into an Excel spreadsheet and crunch the numbers, even though all the names of the mine owners were primarily Anglos, um, more than half of the people living at Cookstown in, in, in 1900 were either Mexican, born in Mexico, or born in the U.S. to Mexican nationals. These are not native uh, New Mexican Hispanics. Uh, so interestingly enough, Murdy McDaniel's uh, story about these Native American Indians is, is perhaps borne out in, in the United States Census. Uh, the most common surnames uh, amongst the 1900 census were Rodriguez, Guardia, Delgado, Hasso, and Gutierrez. Um, kind of speaking about what we, we did before, there were seven brothels and possibly as many as 25 saloons. There was no church and only a single source of drinkable water in the range. Uh, cattle rustling was common by all accounts, and there's clear evidence of claim jumping. So even though somebody may have patented a mining claim, it's obvious in many cases that the mining operations of either nearby claims or just speculators, uh, 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 people that are just looking to, to make it rich out there are not following those orders. So a lot of times we'd see like a, a planned mining claim um, and then we'd see some kind of like shaky operation going on the other side of the hill, uh, which may or may not be contemporaneous, but certainly they didn't have the legal rights to be doing that work. Um, there were blizzards in the winter, dust storms in the summer, fear of hostile Apaches. In fact, during this time period, Cookstown actually got shut off from the rest of the world when a group of Apache camped uh, lower down on the draw so that people couldn't leave for, for um, <laughs> uh, several months. They, the, the Apaches decided to summer in the area. Um, and there's circumstantial evidence of widespread lead poisoning in the water. So even though there was one good um, uh, spring in the area, it appears that a, a lot of people got their water from other sources and got very sick. In fact, what you're looking at there is the most important thing in the entire Cook's range, which is Riley George and his mule team, which, which brought up the water to all the miners, which is how he was able to control a lot of the mining interests. Um, the end. Uh, there was a slow decline in mining fortunes. It never just kind of ends a single day, especially when these are not company-based prospects. Uh, most of the families end up moving into Deming and we we're able to track down a lot of the families. Most major mining operations or all major mining operations have shut down by 1943. Um, uh, in, in the, the land was consolidated, all the private land, all the land that wasn't federally owned was consolidated in the hands of a few ranching families, primarily the Hyatts today. Um, ranching, the Hyatts were a ranching family and ranching existed before and after the mining boom. Uh, however, we do see a sharp change. Uh, ranching in the 19th century meant primarily sheep and goats uh, and, and some cattle. Um, however, a, a, a late uh, spring slash summer blizzard in, in the year is going to escape me right now. It's in the report. Uh, kind of wiped out all the sheep and goats. Unfortunately, they had um, sheared them and then they got a late blizzard and that pretty much killed off the sheep and goat populations and uh, uh, cattle ruled by the mid 20th century. There, there was no more sheep and goat. You, you go out there today, it's all cattle ranching. Uh, so what's the legacy? Um, well, you're left with three very large ghost towns and thousands of mines. It's a popular rock hounding destination and, and gold and silver prospecting is still ongoing. In fact, we met with some people while we were out there doing the survey. If the price of gold or silver gets high enough and it's actually worth uh, taking all those waste piles uh, that were left behind at places like, um, uh, we're looking at the graphic mine, the big piles of graphic mine. If, if, if the price of gold and silver gets high enough, those waste piles will be reprocessed for gold and silver. I mean, there, it just has to be worth it. 
um, and the depend, uh, descendant population is still living in the surrounding area. Uh, but the biggest takeaway is that it's still extremely dangerous. There's open mines, poisonous waste piles and springs, abandoned explosives and failing roads. I do not recommend you go out there today, uh, but you can see kind of a legacy right there in those images. With that, I'll end it up. This is actually the, the that, um, that added that that, that um, railroad track was going into. You can see the crew there. It's the same crew that, that worked on the other project. And you can, of course, um, download these reports as well uh, about um, um, uh, archeology span in the Cook's range. One of the volumes is actually text. And I think the other one is just all tables and figures. So if you're really, really interested in hitting it hard about how many uh, possible Mexican-born um, people were living in Cook's Range in 1900. All those tables are in there. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Uh, it's probably obvious, but there must have been many cultural sites that were destroyed by the mining. Any observations about that? Yes, there were lots of them. Um, and by later peoples, too. Um, the Mimbrous area in general is known for its pot hunting, so I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. Um, certainly, we found uh, prehistoric ceramics on all the mining sites, um, them collecting cur curios and stuff like that. Um, there, there's also some larger hunting blinds and some other features. In, in fact, I think one of the hunting blinds I use in, in my talk last time was a hunting blind up on Quartzsite um, Rim above Cookstown. Um, there, are a, there is a large Native American presence in the area, uh, primarily through most of history with hunters and gatherers. However, there are some large member sites in the areas. They were, they do get sometimes destroyed. However, the members tend to put their sites in places you wouldn't want to mine. Um, so they, they tend, they're, they're more uh, dug up for the value of their pottery and as curiosities than they are dug because there's precious minerals underneath them. Uh, the Apache sites are, are less, um, less luck, like, you know, less lucky in that case. Uh, the Apache tend to place themselves in places where they have um, broad views of the surrounding area. Uh, these usually tend to be up on high places in areas with exposed rock faces where miners like to dig. Sure. Thank you. I have, I have a question. Um, so what did they do with the cotton? They grew cotton, but then what did they do with it? Oh, uh, they may have woven it into clothes. Um, I, I, I'm not a cotton fanatic, but there are cotton fanatics out there that say they also ate the seeds, which is possibly true. I mean, I'm sure you can. I, I, it would certainly work as a food you can eat. Um, I, the, the pollen sample was found under a matate, so perhaps that gives a stronger indication it's being processed as a food, as a, a food source. Um, I, I would assume you would use it for both. You wouldn't use it for one or the other. You'd do both. But so I, I, is there any evidence of weaving or? No, none. But you're talking about a site that is poorly preserved um, out in the Chihuahuan Desert in the Mimbrous Basin, an exposed surface site. So you wouldn't see that. Uh, evidence for that that long ago is probably going to only appear in, in cave sites. Uh, so you're not left with that evidence. In fact, even the, the hardier features that you would expect to survive in some other context really don't survive out of there because of the harshness of the environment. The fact that you're on the members floodplain, it's, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a good place for preservation. The only thing it has going for it is that it's extremely dry. Matt, I think they might have used cop, uh, cotton also to make string and rope and things yeah. like that. Absolutely, nets, okay. things or, of that nature. Also, yeah. things to carry, you know, yeah. like a, like a woven uh, basket sort of thing, so you could carry stuff in it. They they could have, however, most of the examples we see in the archaic period of things like that are woven out of yucca or other kind of materials like that. It, it could be though they were using cotton for those purposes. Certainly, other groups did. Were these people classified as part of the Mogollong culture? They are. They are. Um, so, I. Yes. So Mogion culture is usually considered, uh, usually once you start getting into the, to Mogion and members classifications is after the archaic or early agricultural period. But these are your proto Mogion peoples per se. Um, they're not living in the large, I mean, if you notice the wiki up, 
It's very, very small. It's very, very shallow. It's not very robust. Certainly by the time we get into the Mogollon period, we see much more robust subterranean structures and eventually in some instances above ground architecture and things of that nature. Uh, you know, elaborate, uh, much more elaborate uh, and expansive sites. Um, this is much earlier on that sequence. So, so Matt, how do you, when, when you're out looking for this kind of stuff, um, it looked like you just like dug a heart into the ground. I couldn't tell any difference between the hole you dug and what was around it. How did you know that was a place that they'd had a wiki up or some kind of a structure? Those were actually, the, that wiki up was actually the easiest feature we dug out there because unfortunately most of it's windblown sand. So when you go out to Deming today, especially along the road, you know, once you get into the coppice dunes, you're dealing with a lot of windblown sand. In that case, we were actually blessed. We brought out a backhoe and scraped down uh, to the kind of compact clay slash caliche level. And in, in that case, that wiki up was actually dug into that clay a little bit. And what it did is it actually left a negative signature. So there was actually windblown kind of loose, unconsolidated sands and, 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 and stained with charcoal in that little circular bowl. And then everything else around it was hard as a rock. So it was very easy digging. It was, I, I'm not saying it was, it was brainless, but it's about as, as blessed as you could be in the archeological record, except for having stone architecture where it tells you to stop. It, it, that, and in that case, uh, that caliche substrate, it, it, it is like stone in many ways. It's, it's easy to follow. Um, not all of it was like that, but um, that we were fortunate in that case, which is why it makes a great photo. It's very easy. Anybody can see that there's something there. Um, 2011 was a very great year in my life. I'm thankful to the people of Deming. I thank you for the support I got in doing all the historical research. Um, and I'm very proud of the work I've been able to do in Southwestern New Mexico. And of course, uh, Southwestern New Mexico lives on in me as like a special place that I go back to every year, primarily for hunting. Uh, but I got used to all the wildlife out there because of these projects. It was also the year, uh, you know, you talk about um, things that change your life. Uh, my twins were born in 2010. and 2011, I was gone for pretty much the whole year doing these various oh. projects that you see here. I was away from my family. And, and it, 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 in many ways, those projects led me to all of you uh, because my, my wife was like, you know, the kids turned two while I was out there. And, and she was like, you know, you're, you know, I was gone for the entire work week. Um, I only came back on the weekends. And it's that experience in many ways that drove me to, uh, to look for work at New Mexico historic sites and, 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 and jump ship, I guess, as you were from the Office of Archaeological Studies to New Mexico historic sites. So you can thank those projects, even though I loved my time down there, you can thank those projects for the reason I'm with you guys. <laughs> you guys have been a wonderful audience and, and thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, thank you Matt. <laughs>